Well, thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me to speak on what I thought was asthma. Until a few weeks ago, I was asked to speak on 10,000 thundering typhoons. Now, as a professor of boring respiratory medicine, this is a bit of a challenge. So I've had a turn to a bit of help. And I've taken help from my friend Pooh Bear. Um, sadly, I asked quite a few of my residents and fellows what they thought of Pooh Bear, and they've all looked at me and said, I, I think I've seen the Disney film, which is very disappointing, because I was read this, these books over and over again by my mother. So I am hope I'm looking at the young audience going, I hope if you've got kids, you've got to read them the books. Don't look at the Disney film. So anyway, I've turned to Pooh Bear, Piglet and Friends, to take you through the journey of asthma, and I'm going to challenge what you know about asthma today. Okay? And now Pooh Bear would call Thun a thousand, ten thousand thundering typhoons, a rather blustery day, being very British. Um, and I got conflict of interest. The first one is, I'm rewriting the Australian Asthma Handbook. The second one is, I have no idea what I'm doing. Absolutely <laughs> no idea what I'm doing. And this will become evident through the next few slides. So please don't ask me any questions, because what we're doing is completely wrong. We'll be laughing at our future self, there is no doubt. So, chapter one, Pooh and Piglet go woozle hunting. Okay, good few nods, I'm very pleased with this. And you might remember that Pooh and Piglet decide to look at this mysterious animal, and they discover these footprints, and they chase them over and over again. And you can see from this picture that clearly they're their own footprints. So, you might not have heard of the woozle effect, which is what my talk's all about. These are people who recite, with confidence, great papers that have been published. Actually, when you look at these papers, and I've done it because I've reviewed a lot of papers, and you come back to the source, it's often someone who's come up with a statement in a review article, and they keep circulating, you know, circulating around referencing themselves. And it becomes doctrine, and you start to believe it. Aha! One of my colleagues in Perth has come up with this idea of personality-driven definitions of asthma. You've got some great personalities who speak with great confidence, and you go, must be right because he or she has said it. So a woozle is, uh, is this evidence by citation where, where there's fr frequent citation uh, that leads to uh, um, factoids and myths. And I shall dispel a lot of these in the talk. So the first question is, what's asthma? Okay, that's the first question. How many of you have had parents saying, well, is it asthma, Doc? Professor Bush from the Brompton published a great r review in uh, the archives just recently, last couple of months, where the title was, You Can't Make the Diagnosis of Asthma Until Insert Arbitrary Age. Okay, that was the title. Um, so first of all, let's think about asthma. So you, a lot of you might think you know what you're talking about. But let's think about it. Where does the word asthma come from? Well, actually, asthma means to pants, from the Greek azein, which means Tigger, after bouncing around all the time, has asthma, because he's panting. My dog, not Snowy, but my dog, when running around, his pants. Is that asthma? We've got to be careful with how we de define this disease that we are calling asthma. So that's the first problem. We don't know what to call it. So in fact, this group went along and said, well, let's have a look at how we define asthma, and so looked through the PubMed search, 122 odd papers, and found 60 definitions. Right. So you can see the problem immediately. Doc, is my child got asthma? Well, I don't know. I had a child in clinic the other day when I said that, looked at the mum and said, but you said Professor Jaffe is really clever, knows everything. <laughs> And I thought, oh, I'd better perhaps change the way I approach this. But I'm honest and, 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 uh, and, and truthful that we, we have a problem. You know, we have the Global Initiative for Asthma d Definition, which involves in lower inflammation, the presence of lower inflammation. We, I've got a child in front of me. I have no idea what the lower inflammation is. How does that help? So it's, it's really problematic. So that's the first problem. How do you define asthma? In fact, Martina Fernandez went so far as to say 10 years ago now, he said, Let's abandon the concept of asthma. It's an umbrella term. It's a bit like fever in the 19th century. You've got fever. Imagine saying that now. Thanks, Doc. Got fever. Great. 
We know there's a cause for fever. We're beginning to unravel the, the causes of asthma. Don't call it asthma, because it's not one disease. It's not an umbrella term. Let's abandon it. In fact, if anyone wants some interesting reading, the Lancet Commission published a whole thing on asthma in the last six months, which really is based on, the, on what I'm saying today. We're really challenging this doctrine of, of this one disease. So let's get rid of the term asthma. This is worrying, as I'm writing an Australian asthma handbook. <laughs> now, here's the next question. Wheeze. How many of you here speak another language apart from English? All right, tell me the word for wheeze in that language. I've got whistle. Mm, you've got whistle. Mm, you're right. That's a problem. Wheeze is an English word. There's no other word in another language for wheeze. So, saying to parents, does your child wheeze? Yes, asthma. Doesn't work. In fact, Rachel Kane in, in the East End of London many years ago uh, did a study. She was an epidemiologist um, and looked at what parents thought were wheeze, compared it to junior doctors. And there was no good agreement between less than 50% of what parents thought were wheeze and doctors thought were wheeze. This is a worry, right? You're making a... Take history. 90% of your diagnosis is made on history. Does your child wheeze? Asthma. Okay. So the bad news is junior doctors weren't much better than, than parents. Sorry, but you weren't. So this is a problem. We don't know how to define wheeze. In fact, in the... Um, uh, Isaac study, the International Study of Asthma and Allergy in Children, which is, is, is global, um, we don't even ask parents anymore about whether the child has wheezes or not. We show videos. <coughs> I normally get a round of applause, but that's fine. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. You're now patronizing me. <laughs> and of course, that's not real asthma. It's vocal cord dysfunction. All right, so <laughs> I've cheated there. Okay, which mimics asthma. So here's this other problem. There's another chapter, when we were very young. Children under five. Oh my goodness. Okay. So Global Initiative for Asthma, have a, how to manage asthma in children under five. Gina guidelines. European Respiratory Society, how to manage children under five who wheeze. It's called a viral-induced wheeze. It's called a multi-trigger wheeze. What is it? Is it wheeze? Is it asthma? What is it? There's no... There's no um, there's no agreement across the whole world as to what to call this. And parents are looking at you with your three-year-old going, well, I don't know what I'm talking about. Rubbish. Must get a second opinion. It's asthma. Thank God I found you. <laughs> <laughs> that jappy bloke didn't know what he's talking about. God. It's not asthma. Please, it's not asthma. No. Thank God I found you. That's what happens. Parents want to hear. They don't want to hear the word asthma. So it's a real problem. So many years ago, in the, in the late 90s, a New England Journal of Medicine, a paper was published, a really sentinel paper in Tucson, Arizona, uh, where um, babies who were born had infant lung function testing done and followed up. We now have 20 years data. And, and the, 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 what was found is that there are many different types of children under five preschool wheezes who wheeze. So if your mother smoked antenatally, you have small airways, abnormal lung function, and you'll wheeze. But that disappears by three years of age. So th you can see now what's happening. These groups, these phenotypic groups, are emerging in preschool wheezes. It's not one disease. It can't possibly be one. So we're beginning to unravel these children under five. And this is probably one of the best um, uh, illustrations of what happens in under five. There's basically three groups here. There, there, there are many, many other studies that show perhaps there, there are seven groups of children who wheeze under five, perhaps more. <coughs> but here's an example. And you may say that the transient early wheezes, wheezes are the... The, the, the common viral-induced wheezing children who present only with, with viruses. Now, my colleagues in Perth hate this. They say it's rubbish because children can move into another group. They can become the classic asthmatic that we all know about later on with ATP, as Dom described. Okay. Certainly they can, but I really like this because it really directs the way I approach children. I and mean, I'm hoping the new asthma uh, handbook will actually just give us a, a, a proper way of approaching these children to manage them because ultimately, forget the diagnostic labels, how do we manage these children? So there's an example of, we hope that children who wheeze under five, most of them will grow out um, um, by five years of age, although the truth is, do it, you know, questions have been uh, asked about whether children really grow out of it, but it's something to consider, and when I show parents this graph, it gives them a bit of hope. 
So, what sort of tests can we do? So children under five is very, very difficult to do any. We talk about infant lung function testing. There are very few places in the world that can do it. Um, and I'm not sure that has really a diagnostic um, uh, ability at the moment. And so typically we would say from about five years of age you can do spirometry, although we have got some children from about three and a half years to do spirometry. Skin prick testing is helpful because um, it helps to find whether your children are to a de degree atopic or not. Um, so spirometry is really, really important because occasionally you, you come across a child who actually has intermittent symptoms, but when you do spirometry, it's that classic obstructive picture. And then there's a dilemma. What do you do about treatment? Because Andrew Tai's work from, from Melbourne's cohorts from, from the mid-60s mid shows that if your lung function is bad at, at age seven, eight, it's really, it still remains the same and bad when you're age 50. So you may be predisposed to asthma COPD overlap. So we've got this concept of remodeling later on in life. So it's really important that your children with asthma at least have spirometry um, at least once to, when you investigate them and make the diagnosis, because you might get a shock. So spir spirometry is very important. We can do direct challenges with mandatory, for example, for exercise-induced asthma. And of course, we do other things like cardiopulmonary exercise testing, because often children will come and see me and they go, my asthma's terrible. I I'm on that soccer pitch. After two minutes, I can't breathe. The treatment for asthma, I mean, the treatment for shortness of breath and, and exercise is often more exercise. You just don't fit, right? That's the problem. <laughs> so classically, what happens with exercise-induced asthma is your airways get bigger, right, when you start exercising. And usually at half-time or afterwards, <coughs> do you get bronchoconstriction, okay? Cold air is different. Cold air is a challenge. But um, more exercise. Stop complaining. <laughs> so how do we manage asthma? Here's a challenge. So the first thing is, and, and Dominic has talked about um, how you manage your environmental exposures. So let's reduce environmental exposures. Okay. If you're exposed to environmental tobacco smoke, reduce that. If you know you're allergic to the cat, don't ever sleep in your bed. Okay. So really, really trying to reduce environmental exposures is very, very important. Um, and of course, modifying other things as well. So, so obesity is a problem. A poor Pooh Bear loved his honey, um, stuck in a hole. Okay. So we certainly know that if you if you uh, um, have uh, way above the healthy range in in in, in weight, it can it can uh, um, exacerbate asthma control for sure. Don't forget the nose. Okay. The nose is part of the airway, which is accessible to the finger. Okay. So there, there is. Supposedly a nasobronchial reflex, reflex is a single airway phenomenon. So if you treat the nose, and evidence from adults who treat the nose, you improve lower airway symptoms. The allergic salute, you see that if you see a transverse nasal crease, have a look up the nose, you've got to treat the nose. Okay, it's very, very important in the management of asthma. And you heard that before with thunderstorm asthma as well. Don't forget to check the use of treatment, the, the use of you know, proper spacers, okay? That old beautiful house video shows how you use your spacer. You're, you know, this is how I use my... <laughs> I take it every day, doctor. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's a, you've got to have a look, ask them how they do it, okay? And it has to be age appropriate. And of course, everyone should have an asthma management plan, which should be reviewed every um, six months. It's really, really important. And then we come to the treatment. Everyone knows this, right? It's stepwise. What a load of rubbish. What a load of rubbish. Okay. I help write that. <laughs> okay. And I'm helping write the next one. Load of rubbish. Okay. And I'll, I'll explain why. Okay. So we start off in there, we go to the next one, we go in there, then we argue, we think we should inhale sterile, should maybe be in step one, as it is in adults, you know, in, in BTS guidelines. Oh, we, we have this whole discussion. Rot. Summed up beautifully by Eeyore. We can't all and some of us don't. That's all there is to it. What? What do you mean by that? This. This is what I mean by it. This is the Badger study. I've had to borrow from Wind of the Willows. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't a Badger in AML. Very disappointing. Okay. So in this study, triple crossover study, New England Journal of Medicine, ch children with uh, asthma had the flixotide doubles or Montelukast or fixed dose combination. And what they found in that study is that they could not predict which child was going to 
respond to the treatment. <coughs> Everyone responded differently. Overall, the fixed dose combina combination, the Salmitrov uh, Fatigazone group, did better, but they couldn't. Why is that? That's the answer. Okay? That's why this approach is wrong. It has to be precision medicines. There's poo, there's poo bear. Loads of poo bears. Same poo bear, different look. Okay? And this is what happens in children. Everyone's different. We've all got, you all look different out there. You're all beautiful, but you look different. Okay? You all got a different genotype. As exemplified by the weight study, Montelukast as used intermittently from children six months to five years in the UK. Didn't work compared to placebo, in contrast to the Australian study where it did work. But when they looked at, down at the Alex 5 promoter gene subgroup, it did work in that group. So there's some group of children with Montelukast who respond, maybe 30%. But some go nuts. You have to warn parents about that. The group was the Cerevent um, group, who, um, to a Summitra group, who actually had uh, increased deaths in the original study in the States because of the genotype on the beta receptor and this idea of tachyphylaxis. It's different. There are loads of different genes which respond to loads of different medications. So, how do we prevent it? We talked about preventing allergies. Can we prevent it? Um, asthma developing. People have tried. They're giving inhaled steroids to children um, up until um, from about three years to five years and stop the steroids. And if you're going to get asthma, you're going to get asthma. Inhaled steroids did not help. You're aware of the hygiene hypothesis? We're all born with a T2 um, disposition to wheeze and to have um, ATP, and exposure to environmental stimuli will change us to a T1 phenotype. Here's an example of the 100 acre farm. Beautiful example. A beautiful, um, it was a paper which looked at children who grew up in German farms, and importantly, it was in Germany and Europe. Where, where barns are part of the house. And the exposure to uh, environmental fungi, like the polysaccharides, um, actually reduced um, allergies and asthma. And similarly, this is one of my favorite studies. The Amish and the Hutterites, they come from European stock, went to the US, settled there. Amish do traditional farming, Hutterites modern day farming. Amish asthma allergy, nearly zero. Hutterites, the same. It's, it's, it's the same as back around America. They went into the Amish homes, took the dust, put it into mice. seems to prevent the development of asthma. So what people are doing now is trying to prevent children developing asthma by the use of bronchovaccine. There's a big study going on now. So they take dead, dead uh, microbes um, and to see if they can actually prevent, by stimulating the immune system, the development of asthma. So a real shift in what we are doing. So I want to challenge this comment. This is Dr. Nicola Wilson. The treatment for asthma is burn the carpets and shoot the cats. Dominic said, dogs are great. I've always said, cats are terrible. You shouldn't have cats. But however, this paper was published in Jackie just recently. It said, if you've got a certain genotype and you grow up with a cat, it's going to protect you. So this population approach to asthma is wrong, completely wrong. It has to be precision medicine approach. The bronchovaccine trial, trial may work in some children, but it may actually make some children worse because they've now exposed them with a certain genotype to, to microbiome. We've got to ch take this whole population-based approach and look at the individual. I can't give you a talk on thundering typhoons without mentioning that there is a risk of death. Despite one in 10 children um, in Australia having asthma, thankfully, death is very, very rare. But in, in New South Wales, unfortunately, two to four children die um, a, a, a year with asthma still. And there's some major, major um, um, things you should look out for. Admitted to ICU um, is, is a real factor. Um, lack of control, lack of follow-up, lack of adherence. So it, it, it does kill. It's important to remember that. So finally, we're going to say goodbye to our friends and look to the future. What does it look like? The answer is in deep phenotyping, genotyping, bringing all the omics together so we can do precision medicine, as we're already doing in diseases like cystic fibrosis. We'll be doing that with asthma as well. Be careful about taking population-based studies and applying them to the individual. It's fraught with difficulty. It still remains a try this and see, see in six weeks, see how we go on treatment, but our future will look completely different. 
So with that, I'll say thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Jaffe. I feel like I know more now about what I don't know about Eskimo. There's probably been quite a bit on Twitter, hasn't there, Jesse? Yeah, probably on the theme of what you just said of uh, cognitive dissonance now. <laughs> um, one of the thing that, things that has come up is then who does, uh, and it, it, it's maybe a, a loaded question, but who, who does diagnose asthma and why <laughs> in, in a lot of what you've just said? Yeah, so, so um, I, I think it's very important that we're honest with parents um, as to how we approach this. It's all right to say we don't know stuff. You know, I often sit there Googling with my, my patients who know more about certain diseases than I do because they, they've got invested interest. So I think it's very important to say, um, because some, some parents, as I said before, really want to have the diagnosis of asthma. Others don't, really don't want to have it. Um, I had a, a mum the other day, she, I told her, well, your child's got asthma, and she sort of fell about tears. And I'm thinking, it's just asthma. Um, and she was telling me a child's wheezy gets better with Ventolin. I'm thinking, gee, and I had to sort of help her out into the waiting room as she collapsed into a fit. And I thought, what a strange... And of course, I've become blasé, and it's now she, my child's going to have lifelong uh, um, treatment and steroids. You know, it's, it was, it's, again, I, I love this job because I'm always learning about this approach. So you've got to be careful with, with how you approach the diagnosis. I think that um, it, it is sometimes, re, you know, um, as my colleague Ian Balfour in, um, in, in the Brompton would say, they're very different uh, uh, classifications for grades of evidence, but there should be a D, you know, which, which is bleeding the obvious, <laughs> you know. That if a child, uh, uh, you know, wheezes, you give uh, in, 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 inhales uh, short-acting beta agonists, they get better. You put them onto a long uh, onto inhaled steroids, and they get better. That's asthma. Um, the importance is, you, you, I do think that children should have a spirometry if they're over five. I think it's really, really important because of this concept of remodeling, um, and, and whether and, and it's, a, it's a problem for me because I don't know. You have to have the benefits of of long-term um, inhaled steroids. Um, and there's a real push, by the way, for putting people on the inhaled steroids early, really early, which is a, in, it, it's an issue I have. You know, if you wheeze once in, in Canada, you're on inhaled steroids because that, 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 that to them, is a, a predictor of, of uh, a recurrent wheeze. So you, you, you've got to be really careful. I, mean, I think it can be obvious, but I think sometimes there's many other causes for wheezing. And, and, and uh, um, you've got to just be, obviously, like everything... Um, it's, uh, it's either obvious or it's not, and, and uh, I think general practitioners are well-placed to do it. General practitioners are well-placed, but um, sometimes you just need a bit of thought. Um, Mary Smith asked, can we record an audio clip of your Wii simulation so that it can be played on phones? It, it, it is copyrighted, so I'm afraid I can't do that. <laughs> we, we might have to release that as a separate audio piece That's from right. this talk for you don't forget the bubbles. Um, and I guess the... The other thing that came up a little bit was just some interesting or interest around the linguistics of um, the absence of wheeze from other languages. Um, how, how is asthma uh, explained, I guess, within those languages that don't use that? And that's probably my, our cultural frame to that. But. Yeah, no, no. So it's, it's, it's often, it's difficult. Um, and often having video, so I will have different sounds, for example, and I will play the sound. So, um, you know, parents will often mix up sort of stutter, which is the <laughs> type of wheezing. Um, so, you know, often having those sounds and, and, and going through the different videos to, to make sure that you've got the diagnosis or, and, and what they describe it to you. Because often you'll play the stutter and they go, oh, yeah, that's what your child does, which is completely different, which isn't wheezing. So, 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 so really having the sounds present in the video. And there's a whole, there's a whole approach in Europe uh, where they're trying to look at um, actually generating digital... Um, sound files, so you can actually um, teach what wheeze is. Um, it hasn't been that successful at the moment, but they are trying to do it through electronic stethoscopes, and um, so people can understand and have files that they actually play the, 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 to their uh, uh, patients' parents to get it right. And Nikki had something. Actually, in Maltese, it's tis for you, um, which was like uh, whistling in your chest. Sweet, <laughs> whistling in your chest. Yeah. So I, it's. Uh, it's, it's difficult to understand. I mean, we, we think we understand, but of course, a vascular ring gives you whistling in your chest. So uh, you've got to be careful you get the diagnosis right. Excellent. Over the room. Hello, thank you. Um, hi, Professor Jaffe. Thanks for your talk. I'm a um, junior doctor. I just wondered if you could comment on, sometimes in my experience, what I see is children who repeatedly you know, get, are admitted with viral-induced wheeze, 
And sometimes I feel like this fear of labelling it asthma in, say, the under fives. I don't know, do you, do you think that sort of... Um, it doesn't sort of stress enough to the parents the importance of using their Ventolin correctly because they just seem to yeah. keep coming back. And I wonder if maybe if we tried to impart to them the seriousness of, you know, calling it asthma, they would actually, you know, take it seriously? What do you think? Yes, no, that's a, look, that's a really good point. And I think that, that, that there's definitely a shift because of asthma deaths um, to start inhaled steroids properly. And in fact, it may be that I'm, I'm trying to predict what the next... Um, stepwise things and look like an Australian asthma handbook and it, for example in adults there's a real shift now to to move towards using um, fixed dose combinations as needed so hardly any adults are on on, on short-acting beta agonists it's quite extraordinary and there's a shift because of, of that of that concern um, and I think that look it's, it's down to education ultimately so it's around us trying to agree with what we're trying to say to patients um, the viral induced wheezes are ri the really problematic because, you know, how do you, it, you know, you manage them as if they were asthmatic with asthma treatment. Um, and they're very, and this is what we're trying to, to address in the, in the new version of asthma, of the Australian Asthma Handbook. And I think what we, we, we've actually just recently been charged with the idea to go, go away and, and come up with something new. Because if it was easy, someone else would have done it. And, and what we, we're going to look at is just call it preschool wheeze. And if it's mild, and we look and look at severity, and we can look at frequency, and that's going to help guide treatment. And I think it's really important. So if you if you have viral induced wheeze and it's mild once every two or three three um, you know three times a year, you're not going to put that child, and you shouldn't put them on an inhaled steroid. The worry I have is that if you say it's asthma, it's, oh, therefore you treat with inhaled steroids, and it's extraordinary how many children are on inhaled steroids, or just take your purple puffer as you need it. You know, well. Thankfully, it's now on authority as of the 1st of August. So we've got, you know, making some progress to, to explain to people who prescri prescribe the importance of uh, thinking about your prescribing. It's the same like, you know, docs in ED, child comes in and immediately, you know, wheezing, gets oral steroids, gets, you know, it's, it's brainstem stuff. Whereas it's really, and you would have had a talk yesterday on the PERS study. Well, there's a contradictory study in the UK that shows in the New England Journal that oral steroids do not work in children under five. So it's about thinking. And of course, again, that's not true because there are some children whom definitely works. And again, it's applying that population-based data to the individual, which is a nightmare. So in the future, what will happen in my clinic, someone will come in, they'll spit into a machine, it'll do their genotype, and they'll spit out the, 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 the right medication, and you won't need me anymore. So that's what I'm hoping will happen in the future. So be careful with the diagnosis of asthma because you you'll stop thinking. And that's what I'm trying to challenge you to do. Think about every child you see. It's not a brainstem reaction, give inhaled steroids, you know, here's your asthma management plan, off you go. It's not that. Okay, thank you very much.